Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, so uh, not really just to say where I work, but uh, I, I, I'm currently unemployed, though rumor has it I'm joining Crunchy Data next month. Um, but I spent the last 10 years working on, uh, on Citus and other Postgres extensions on basically uh, figuring out ways to distribute Postgres. And I've often given talks on Citus and distributed Postgres. And a lot of the time, uh, you kind of talk about algorithms for distributed query planning, uh, which is, which is and, and distributed transactions, deadlock detections, other things. And it's pretty interesting, you know, algorithms are often satisfying. You have a problem and an algorithm and then a solution. Um, but then at the end of the day, I kind of look back and feel like, but this is not what I as a distributed database engineer actually spend a lot of time on, like spend a lot of time thinking about. And it's also not the aspect of a distributed database architecture that users actually struggle with. So there's something else going on. And the thing that's very fundamental about distributed systems is trade-offs. And when you're a vendor, or, or even when you're writing a paper, you rarely really, really talk about the trade-offs. Like, what are the downsides of my system? Because, you know, you get a 30-second pitch or something to someone, and, and you tell, what's great about the system? How greatly it scales? Um, and then there's all these different architectures out there now, which distribute Postgres in different ways, and they all make different trade-offs. So I wanted to do a talk to kind of just talk through that, look at some example architectures and what kind of trade-offs they're making. This is a bit of an experiment. Uh, in a way, it's going to be a very unsatisfying talk because I'm not going to offer you solutions. I'm just going to sort of walk you through what happens when I use certain types of distributed systems architectures. So the, the reference architecture that we're kind of comparing everything to is just single machine Postgres. Think I buy a bare metal server with modern hardware, NVMe drive, lots of memory, lots of CPUs, um, and I run Postgres on it. And in general, this is going to be extremely fast. Um, like you have no network latency, you can use the full IOPS of your disk device, your you know, NVMe drives, disk latency is often like 20 to 100 microseconds, uh, relatively low cost for the amount of performance you get. And, uh, I mean, maybe you have some spare capacity, but you can put your application server on the same machine. Um, so why wouldn't you just do this? This sounds great. Um, well, it comes with some downsides. So there's obvious operational hazards of running your database, which is maybe the key part of your application, the key part of your business, on a single machine. If the machine fails or the data center fails, your application is down, maybe your business is down. If a disk fails, your data is gone. Uh, if you get too much traffic, your system is overloaded, there's, there's no escape hatch, that, on, no, no button on your machine of like increased power or something. Uh, if your disk runs out, if you run out of disk space, you're going to have a bad time too. Like that usually leads to some, some downtime. Um, so the idea of most distributed architectures is fixing some of the operational hazards of, uh, of a single machine using a distributed setup. Most typically, this is done in uh, the cloud, like in, in large cloud providers that can provide you with uh, lots of resources. Uh, I mean, you could do it on-prem. You could buy a bunch of machines and set them up in some kind of topology. But in the cloud, you just have a lot more flexibility to kind of share resources between different, uh, different customers, which increases the e efficiency and, and flexibility a lot. So most of my talk is going to be in the context of the cloud, though it's not entirely exclusive to that. So the goal of most distributed database architecture is to uh, basically offer whatever the single machine offers in terms of functionality, transactional semantics, uh, and other things, but with better things, like better durability, better availability, uh, better scalability. Um, so that's your you know, idealized goal. And you have some mechanisms available to do that. You can replicate the data, place multiple copies on different machines distributed data, place different parts of your data on different machines, or decentralization where you take some DBMS functions and place them on a different machine. And the reality is when you do any of these things, you're always going to have to make some concessions in terms of performance, transactional semantics, functionality. Uh, maybe you, know, you, you cannot immediately read your writes. Maybe you cannot do writes via a certain endpoint, or uh, operational complexity. Basically, the rule in distributed systems, or especially distributed databases, is if you get something nice, you're going to have to give up something nice. 
And when we talk about distributed architecture, there's not one sort of super distributed architecture. Um, like distributed architectures can actually appear in many different layers of database management systems. At the top, there's, you know, the client could just know about different databases and write to multiple endpoints or put some data in, in, in database one, some data in database two. So it's kind of manual uh, sharding. Um, so then the database doesn't know anything about distribution, but the client does. Uh, at the other extreme, the disk can be a distributed system. So then Postgres doesn't really know that it's running on something distributed, but the disk internally is, is replicated or, or partitioned across multiple machines. And then there's all these layers in between. So what I want to do is talk through a few of these architectures that hook into different layers, uh, starting with the most common conventional ones and see what kind of trade-offs we're making when we use these kind of solutions to uh, escape the operational hazards of running on a single machine. Uh, so we'll start with network attached block storage, which is very you know, common, and then uh, get into more exotic advanced architectures. Um, and the two questions you kind of always have to ask if you look at any kind of distributed architecture, whether as a user or as a developer, is what are the trade-offs in terms of latency, efficiency, cost, scalability, availability, uh, complexity, and so it's not just about like CAP, it's like there's, there's all these, there's, there's no nice acronym to, to capture them all. And for which workloads am I making these trade-offs? Um, you know, many systems like that are, let's say, good at analytics are not necessarily also good at lookups. Like you kind of make different trade-offs for different, uh, different types of workloads. Now there's not gonna be any kind of clear cut uh, bulleted answer to any, either of these questions. These are kind of more questions to, uh, to raise discussion and to kind of build a mental model of like, huh, what, what, what am I actually running Postgres on? One important thing to point out, because it's so fundamental about distributed systems and distributed databases, is uh, the perils of latency. So latency is uh, something we almost always have, at least between the client and the database server, at least assuming those run on different machines. Uh, so, because Postgres has this synchronous interactive protocol, so I send the begin, I wait for Postgres to respond, then I send maybe the first query, I wait for Postgres to respond, and then update, and then commit. Uh, now, if Postgres itself is a distributed system, then maybe when a select comes in, it needs to make some internal network round trips, or may need, just need to write, read from a, a remote disk to, to get the data, uh, similar with, with update. Um, and one thing that's usually very noticeable is the commit, because this is a point where I write to disk and actually need to wait for the disk to say, hey, this, this data has been, been written to disk. And so if I need to do network round trips to do that, uh, I might be waiting for a relatively long time. Um, and while I'm waiting, um, any locks taken by, for example, my uh, my update are going to be held. So this can actually have some nasty consequences in terms of concurrency. But actually the more important point is that this is happening on a single session and um, that session just spends quite a bit of time waiting. And so if my transaction overall takes like 20 milliseconds, uh, I cannot do more than 50 transactions per second on that session. There's just, there's just no way. Um, and then, of course, I can, if I need higher throughput than that, I can have many sessions. But then, so far, Postgres has a process-based architecture. Uh, there's, you know, large servers can handle thousands of sessions, but not like tens of thousands of sessions very well. So you're kind of limited by, by the memory, by contention between processes. Um, and also on the application side, it's not always practical to have a lot of sessions. So there's actually kind of mathematical limit uh, on, on database throughput that you run into, which is based on the average response time, which can get pretty high in a distributed system. So that's something to watch out for. So let's dive into the architectures. So a very conventional architecture is network attached block storage. This, uh, like on, on Amazon, is what we call Elastic Block Store. On Azure, it would be called Premium SSD. So there's different implementations of it, but they all come down to a similar set of ideas. Um, so cloud providers run Postgres in virtual machines, uh, which sit in hypervisors. The hypervisor exposes uh, a disk device to the virtual machine, 
but when the virtual machine tries to uh, write to it or read from it, it actually makes a call over the network to some uh, block storage API. And there, the data gets uh, replicated to multiple nodes. So if you do a write, it typically takes a bit longer because it involves extra network round trips. But even a read involves at least one network round trip. This tends to go over multi-tenant networks where we, or the, like all these resources are multi-tenant, so we're sharing with others, which usually puts some more uh, like restrictive bandwidth limits uh, than if we had like our own dedicated hardware. Uh, there can also be queues, which increase the latency. But overall, this is actually an extremely nice architecture because it gives us a lot of good stuff. One is, uh, I can deal with disk failure. Like the storage system will just do that internally. I probably won't even notice it. Uh, if a replica, if a storage node is lost, it will just internally re-replicate the, the blocks. Um, I can also deal with machine failure much better. Like if the machine which is running my virtual machine fails, I can, the cloud provider can find another physical machine, start the VM there, and it can reattach to the disk. I don't have this problem that my, my data is tied to the single machine. I can also do, use that to scale up or scale down. I can resize the disk if I run out of disk space. So it has a lot of operational benefits. So, but, so you get a lot of nice things. But if you get a lot of nice things, you have to give up a lot of nice things or something very nice. And in this case, it's primarily performance. So your disk latency, if you compare it to modern hardware and VME drives, goes up by at least a factor 10, maybe more. Um, so your response time will be much higher, so you're going to hold on to locks for longer, so it's harder to actually get to high throughputs because your response time is higher. Um, the IOPS, which usually measure in well over a million for an NVMe drive, uh, now is usually measured in the thousands. Um, so again, like two orders of magnitude worse. So you get really, really worse performance. Now, modern NVMe drives are so fast that Postgres doesn't always manage to kind of fully utilize them. But still, like, you're, you're actually giving up quite a lot here. And then also, because your disk is a bit slow, like if you have to go through crash recovery, uh, where you kind of replay the recent write-ahead log to kind of recreate the changes to the pages in, of the data files, uh, that can now take longer because your disk is kind of slow. And also, this, this can just be costlier than having this. But still, for most of us, not all of us, but most of us, this is actually a good trade-off because in the end, durability and availability and some level of flexibility for around you know, disk size, for example, are just more important than performance, even though it's really much worse performance. <laughs> then another architecture that's, that's very conventional is uh, read replicas. And one of the interesting things about read replicas is it's, it's an opportunity for you to kind of define your own distributed system, like your own topology. You decide uh, how many nodes are involved and, and which node listens to which other node. Um, and so read replicas can help you scale the read throughput if you have a very large number of read queries per second. Uh, you can also put a read replica in a different region closer to uh, some of your users or some of your application servers, so they get lower read latency. Uh, that server will probably lag a bit more because it's further away. Um, and then you can also improve availability through auto failover. Now, there's usually uh, a lot of talks about auto failover, and it has interesting trade offs, but because of time, I'll, 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 I'll not discuss that very much. But I'll, I'd like to focus on scaling the read throughput. So, the basic idea is that. Uh, you have a primary server, you have a bunch of replicas and a load balancer in front of them. Uh, there are several different ways of load balancing. They also have some, some interesting trade-offs. But like one question is um, sort of minor, but do you include the primary and the load balancer? Um, so there are some pros and cons. Like pro is biggest pro is probably that you can then scale the number of replicas to zero and your load balancer still has someone to talk to. Uh, so you can continue serving reads. Um, and you get a little bit of extra capacity. A downside is then you put still a bunch of lo load on the primary that you didn't really have to put there. Um, and because one of the nice things about read replicas, you can not just scale the number of reads per second that your system can handle. It also can potentially take work away from the primary. So the primary now has more resources available to do writes. So it actually helps your writes to add read replicas. But um, this setup comes with some, uh, some, some, some tricky uh, distributed systems issues. 
So a notable one is what the server systems people call uh, read your writes consistency. Other people might call it, you know, notes are stale. But if you have uh, queries in your applications, like there's a button in your web shop where you insert into the shopping cart and then you immediately switch to the page that shows the shopping cart. That read from the, uh, from the shopping cart probably shouldn't go to a read replica because read replicas can be behind. So you might not see the item that you just inserted into the shopping cart yet if you do a read from the, uh, from the replica. And What's uh, a bit challenging is that the database doesn't know which queries are related. You know, you know as the developer perhaps, and sometimes it's actually very subtle, you might not know. But um, like it's, very, it's actually kind of hard for databases to, to, to resolve this, uh, this problem. So you as a developer then need to be very selective about which reads can actually go to my replica and which, which can't. And so it's gonna be hard to make that, uh, make that decision. There can be other examples where if the replicas are doing search or searching, you're using them to search the product catalog, and you know someone inserts something new in the product catalog, it it, it doesn't so much matter that uh, it doesn't instantly show up. I mean, because the user doesn't know that you're inserting something in the product catalog, so they don't care. There's no relationship in that case. So that relationship is between these writes and reads is, is kind of subtle. Um, another related problem is even if there's um, no kind of dependent writes and reads. If you switch between replicas, they might be on different uh, different LSNs. So some replicas are a bit further behind than others, and that means that if you load balance, you're going to keep seeing different versions of the database, and that can give some quirky issues where there, maybe there's a count and you only expect it to go up, but suddenly it goes down because you went back in time to an older replica or uh, maybe you hit refresh on a search page and your product suddenly disappears. Uh, so this can lead to some issues. Uh, the other thing about read replicas is um, they work great as long as most of the data that's frequently read fits in memory because then all of them will have it in memory and will serve it as quickly as they can. And you can get to super high throughputs, you know, all these, all these replicas can take uh, thousands of connections potentially if they're big machines and they can maybe do like 100,000 reads per second. Um, but they all cache the same stuff. So if your working set, like the part of your data that gets read frequently, uh, starts outgrowing the memory, they're all gonna, it's gonna happen on all machines at the same time, more or less. So then you get a lot of cache misses on all the machines and they're all doing a lot of I.O. And they're all roughly doing the same I.O. because they, uh, they, they get sort of, uniformly distributed the same work. Um, and so you can sc still scale that by adding more read replicas, but they're all gonna be extremely inefficient. So like at some point, maybe you have 10 replicas with 100 gigabytes of memory each, you have a terabyte uh, of memory in, in, in principle, but maybe your data, your working set is 300 gigabytes, so that's way too big for each individual machine, so you're doing a lot of uh, trashing. So that's, that's a, a nasty thing. Now there's ways to solve these things, like you could be smarter about assigning queries to replicas, but then you have more operational complexity, like how do I deal with hotspots if some keys are, are read far more often than others, like how do I rebalance that? Uh, similarly, like there's ways around the consistency issue. You could ask the primary, what's, what's the current LSN, and then wait for the replica to catch up, for example. But now your response time goes up by an unbounded amount. So you got something nice, but you gave up something nice. So read replicas, they have uh, some very cool benefits, like you can scale the, root, the, the throughput linearly, for reads at least. Um, then, uh, you know, I can also use them to lower latency, especially in global applications. Um, my, the load of my primary goes down, that's, that's pretty, pretty huge. Um, but then I have to deal with eventual consistency, no monotonic read consistency, and poor cache usage, and that can be quite hard. So you don't want to kind of go here right away usually. Uh, maybe if you have, let's say, more than 100,000 reads per second, and of course it depends on what kind of reads, maybe it's a lower number, but uh, if you have a heavy CPU bottleneck, this can be a good way to, to get out of that. But then you're gonna have to start dealing with, with the consequences of uh, using read replicas. So an another architecture that is uh, becoming more popular is, uh, one that doesn't really have a very good name, 
Uh, some people call it decoupled storage and compute, but I, it, it's not so much more decoupled than network attached storage. Disaggregated storage is similar. Um, log structured storage is probably a good name, but it's, it's also a bit vague. So I, I've just decided to call it DBMS optimized storage. But it's basically like Aurora and, and others. And um, the idea behind this, this architecture comes from the observation that uh, what database syst management systems do is a little bit redundant sometimes. Like everything that gets written to the database goes into the write ahead log, and the, we also write it to data file pages, and both of those things go to disk. So we're writing the same information twice. Um, and, and actually, what happens is if you do an insert, that insert goes into a particular page. There's probably an index, and we're going to have to update a few pages in that index. So we're actually going to have several I.O. requests per insert at some point. Uh, they don't have to happen immediately, but they will happen. And on the write-ahead log, we're kind of packing all these changes neatly together in the log, and then doing one I.O. request for a whole bunch of inserts. And so instead of having one I.O. request for a whole bunch of inserts, I have multiple I.O. requests for one insert. Um, so the number of page writes is way bigger than the number of write-ahead log writes, typically. But they're redundant. So the idea in DBMS optimized storage is that you only write the write-ahead log and that the storage layer itself knows how to internally apply the write-ahead log to pages. And then uh, Postgres will still read from the storage, it will still read pages, but it will not itself write pages to, to disk. And so this can give you some interesting performance benefits. Uh, in the Aurora case, there's uh, six-way replication also across availability zones. Um, and so this is actually a six times amplification of the write-ahead log. But still, the argument is that this is uh, less traffic than, than the page writes. This argument doesn't always hold. Like, uh, if you think of a, a table without an index and inserts coming in, I mean, we have a heap data structure, stuff, inserts go into the first page, page is full, we go into the second page, and at some point, uh, that first page, which now contains a whole bunch of records, will get written to disk. So, in that case, we actually also have only one I.O. request for a whole bunch of inserts for the pages. Um, and then the amplification of the write-ahead log writes actually becomes worse than, uh, than writing both the write-ahead log and the pages once. Uh, but there are some other, other benefits to this architecture. For example, replicas can uh, reuse the storage so they don't need their own disks. Um, but like overall, actually, the, the, the things you get out of the architecture are a little bit subtle. You get some, some performance benefits, potentially, especially for more complex workloads. You get some storage efficiency benefits. Um, but the nice thing is, like, if, if you get uh, like sort of nice things, you only have to give up sort of nice things. You don't have to give up something really bad. So the main downside of this architecture is usually the write latency, because now we're writing the write-ahead log to multiple data centers. That usually takes a bit longer than just writing it even to a network touch storage device that's in the same data center. Um, but then uh, I can have some potential performance benefits. Crash recovery kind of goes away, because if I crash, I just reattach to the storage, and it already has done all the recovery for me. Um, then replicas can reuse storage. But probably the biggest benefit of this architecture is that it's just a bit less rigid than the network attached storage architecture. So um, you can, for example, do disk attach and detach faster, which allows you to very quickly move around database servers. Uh, because with network attached storage, they're managed from the hypervisor, which is managed by a control plane, which always takes a very long time to do stuff. And this actually is managed from the data plane. But um, another big downside of most of these systems is cost, especially in terms of price performance. Um, so it's, it's worth measuring, uh, and, and because they might actually charge per I.O. request, which no, no other architecture does. So it's worth measuring, if I put load on this and I, I pay the extra I.O. cost, uh, does it actually give me better performance, for example, than buying a bigger machine? That's not always very clear. This is a much more subtle architecture. Um, a more crude architecture is uh, sharding. So, um, like, there's, I'm, I'll, I'll mainly use Citus as the reference, given that it's been around for a, long, for a while. Uh, Aurora Limitless is something in preview that, that does a, a similar thing. Um, so, the basic idea is 
that uh, tables are distributed by a shard key, which is a column or a set of columns, or replicated across uh, multiple nodes. All these nodes are, are primary nodes, um, though they can individually also have, have replicas, like you can layer these different distributed systems architectures. They probably have net network attached disks in most cases. Um, and you can connect to any of the nodes, and then if you query the table, that query will transparently be routed to the node that actually stores the data for that query, or if we don't know which node it stores it, it will be paralyzed across all the nodes. Uh, tables can be co-located, so you can do joins and foreign keys uh, on, that include the shard key very efficiently, and uh, that you can also have reference tables that are replicated everywhere. So in this system, if an insert comes in, uh, let's say we have a load balancer, then we, uh, you know, it will just go to some random node based on sort of hashing or randomness, um, and that node might not have the, the shard in which we need to do that insert, so that node will connect to the actual node that has the, the shard we need. Um, so now we're adding an extra network round trip to every insert, and some of the things that may have uh, made sense before, let's say, in, in, in a just regular network attached storage architecture, where if we see uh, you know, high write latency, we only suffer from it at commit time. So one thing we can do in that architecture is create a transaction block that does lots of inserts and then a commit. Here, that doesn't help us very much because every insert is still going to do lengthy network round trips to, to another node. Um, so you kind of have to be a little bit cautious about that. On the one hand, uh, yeah, the system can scale to accommodate a lot of concurrent inserts. On the other hand, you're going to pay that extra network round trip and your, your theoretical throughput might actually uh, be, be limited. So one way you can deal with that is by batching work. There's so a one way to batch or, or to pipeline. So one way to do that is to, whenever possible, uh, load data in batches via copy. Copy, uh, the protocol is just, I, I do a copy command and I send a whole bunch of bytes to the, to the database server. And so it can just parse those and send those to the right nodes without immediately having to give feedback to the client. So then we don't suffer from those network round trips so much. Um, kind of a, a sweet spot for, uh, for sharded architectures is queries that do relatively compute heavy stuff, like whether it's you know, using, using vectors, doing joins, using big JSON objects. Um, because on a single machine, those, even with a lower throughput, you're, you're quickly going to hit the CPU bottleneck, whereas in a sharded architecture, you can quite nicely uh, divide that work over, over many machines. So for, for something like uh, vectors, like sharding can be, a, can be a good fit. Also for um, like more complex software as a service applications that have a natural shard key, they often do joins between different tables. Uh, those joins can nicely be pushed down into the nodes. Um, in the Citus case, you can also do parallel queries across multiple cores uh, on all the nodes. And then uh, this is nice because it just speeds up the query quite a bit compared to a single machine. Now you're using all these, maybe you have a thousand cores, you can do, use a thousand cores to answer your query. Um, and so that's a good thing. Uh, but then if you have a query that's filtering by something that's not the shard key, which might be quite common, and, and here it's, it's actually uh, a, a little tricky because I have an items table, it probably has some kind of item ID, but I decided to have the user ID be the shard key. Um, and that means that if I do a lookup just by the item ID, even if I only expect it to, sing, to return a single row, my database, my, you know, distributed query planning layer doesn't know where that row is, so it decides to query all the shards in parallel and have the overhead of doing the query planning and execution many times. So this actually scales very poorly. Um, so that's one of the, the tricky things about uh, a sharded architecture. Uh, the other thing is that if you're doing these kind of parallel queries, you could have transactions across multiple nodes that are committing concurrently, and it might happen that you see that transaction as committed on one node, but not yet committed on another node. Um, 
So this is a challenge, like there are snapshot isolation solutions, but they also come with particular performance penalties, which make actually using a sharded system uh, less attractive usually, though there's better and better solutions using uh, very accurate clocks. So with, shard with sharding, you get these pretty significant, pretty nice uh, things, like scaling the read throughput, scaling the write throughput, because you can just keep adding more CPU, more disks, more IOPS, uh, especially if I have a lot of data, like the bigger Citus installation, they do petabytes of data. Uh, I don't longer have this working set problem. Every, every node is caching different stuff. I can rebalance to deal with hotspots. I can parallelize queries, a lot of nice things. But then I also have to give up nice things. And so the nice things I have to give up is now every statement is going to incur latency, and I have to deal with that. Uh, it might not make sense anymore to do lots of single row inserts if that can at all be avoided. Um, then my data modeling decisions, they tend to have high impact on performance, like the shard key is, is everything. Uh, now luckily you can use hybrid models where some tables are sharded and, and others not, but still you're, you, for the sharded tables you're gonna have to uh, deal with that. Um, so the general guideline is for multi-tenant apps, um, it's actually usually a pretty good fit because the data model uh, lends itself extremely well to, to sharding. And if you, you could actually do this on a single node and not really suffer, like on a, a shard it on a single node and not actually suffer from any of the, of the network round trips and then later, later scale out. For other workloads, it kind of becomes uh, more interesting than the alternatives, like you know, tweaking your, your database. If you have a large working set, let's say lar larger than 100 gigabytes or just very compute heavy queries. Um, another very interesting distributed Postgres architecture is, uh, is Active Active. So there's a few different systems. Uh, BDR is kind of the original one. Uh, PG Active, I think it's by Amazon. PG Edge is, is, is somewhere in uh, the other room. So uh, the idea here is that um, we have a bunch of primary nodes, meaning you know, nodes taking writes uh, and reads. And at any given time, we can read to any of them and we can write to any of them. And, um, and that's, that's nice because then I can have a node, like I can just connect to the node that's nearest, get low read latency, low write latency. I get super good availability because even if all the other nodes are down, I can probably still do reads and writes. Uh, but you know, those are super nice things. But the consequ consequence is that I have some pretty strange anomalies. Um, so the active active systems, they don't prevent update conflicts in advance. Like normally in Postgres, if you have two concurrent updates uh, onto the same row, one of them will take a lock and the other one will block until the first one is committed. That doesn't happen here. So I could have a situation where I'm doing something simple like keeping counters in a table and I have a counter that's currently at four. I increment it two times, but it happens to be via two different servers. Uh, and so they'll both independently increase the counter from four to five. And then usually there's some sim simple policy of like which of these two updates is gonna be the, the winner. And, and, uh, but in any case, they both agree that the new value is five. Even though from the application point of view, I wanted to increase it to six. Um, but so that, that's kind of the challenge of, of an active active system. But then uh, in terms of, you know, some of the, the nice things you get there, uh, they are pretty significant. So you get very high read and write availability, which is the only architecture that gives you like really high write availability. Uh, very low read and write latency, also very nice. Read throughput scales linearly, like it works just like read replicas. I can just have many of these and, and read from them. With writes, you have to be a little bit careful because every write triggers another write on all the other nodes, so it doesn't, doesn't scale. Um, but then the downside is, well, first I have the same downsides as read replicas, eventual read your writes consistency, no monotonic read consistency. But the really painful part is that I don't have this linear history of writes where I know this, this write happened before that write, this write depends on that write. And so it's, it's pretty hard to program against these things, but for certain simple data models, like queues where I just, I just insert stuff and I delete stuff, I don't really update stuff. So that's a very nice model where you don't necessarily suffer too much from, uh, from the downside of, of the active-active architecture. 
And of course, like, if you really need the benefits, you need to start thinking very carefully of like, how can I program my application in a way that uh, like, I can work within these constraints? Because that's usually the consequence. If you really want the nice things, you have to really go back to your application and change it in ways that deal with the, uh, the downsides. Uh, for example, there's, uh, I think BDR and some other systems, they offer these CRDT data structures where you uh, write the data in a very particular way such that the system can later reconcile it more, more easily. Um, so finally, there's kind of the distributed SQL architecture. Um, it's also not, not a great name, but so it's systems like Yugabyte and CockroachDB and Spanner. Uh, it's not a great name because you know, we have lots of distributed architectures on which we can run uh, Postgres. So I, I, I like to refer to it as distributed key value storage with SQL. Um, because this is essentially a kind of evolution of the NoSQL databases of the key value stores uh, where you have A, uh, transactions across multiple keys, uh, and B, you have a SQL layer, a distributed SQL layer on top of the key value stores. And then the key value stores, like you have uh, essentially sh uh, shards like that represent key ranges with the first part of the key being the table name um, or the table ID and then the second part being, let's say, the primary key. And then um, all tables and indexes kind of map into a key value store. And the individual shards of the key value store are replicated using something like, like Paxos or, or Raft, a consensus algorithm. And this has some nice characteristics because here if I lose a node, um, the traffic that that node was handling will kind of just redistribute among the other uh, nodes, so that's a bit nicer than having a hot standby that's sort of doing nothing, like if all of these nodes had a hot standby that's doing nothing all day just waiting for the primary to fail. Uh, it can be a little bit more efficient, unless you also want to be able to handle uh, availability zone failure, then it's just convert just to be a similar thing. Um, so with these, this architecture, you get nice availability properties, um, probably in many cases, a little bit nicer than, than Postgres. Um, like, for, if you use them as key value stores, they're simple, like, CRUD operations, they scale really well. Um, and they don't usually require you to make additional data modeling steps compared to the sharded systems. But the issue is that a lot of internal operations incur extra network round trips. Usually, like, the tables are not co-located with each other for joins. Even the indexes are not co-located with the tables. So even doing an index lookup often requires many network round trips, so your response time becomes really large. And the Postgres protocol is just not, uh, not an ideal protocol to use if you have a database with very high response time. Um, and also, they tend to be a little bit less mature and optimized than, than uh, Postgres itself. So, general guideline, very subjective, but, you know, just use Postgres. But uh, definitely there are cases where the availability benefits can, can, be, uh, can be useful compared to a traditional uh, setup with the hot standby. All right. So, that was a, a, a quick flyover of a whole bunch of uh, distributed database architectures. And um, I didn't cover, you know, every, every possible architecture in existence, but I wanted to kind of, you know, dive into this architecture and discuss, like, you know, any, anytime you get a nice thing, you give up a nice thing, because that's the fundamental thing that they all have in common. Um, so almost nothing comes for free, so you have to keep asking yourself uh, when you, you know, when, when you're being sold something or you're trying to solve your scalability problem, what do I really want, what do I really need? Which architecture gives me that, but then what are the downsides of that architecture and what can I tolerate in my application? Can it tolerate still reads? Can it tolerate higher latency? Uh, can it tolerate some, some kind of data model changes? Uh, and, and am I able to change that? Um, and so these are important questions uh, to keep asking yourself. All right, thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? So, any questions? Nobody? Right, so uh, just before everyone leaves, uh, okay, just one question then. Hi, 
Okay, thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned um, timestamp to get a global snapshot. Mm -hmm. Is it something that, and this morning there were also talk where it was mentioned um, two-phase commit or stuff like that in a distributed cluster. Mm -hmm. Did you already evaluate to get a new uh, serializable mode where you serialize over a distributed cluster? So instead of trying to resolve a conflict, the developer in front, I mean the application side, can say, I need a transaction which is already valid globally and work on this data, the other side. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely um, always things you can do, for example, with, uh, with smarter clients where, let's say, the client uh, knows about sharding, for example, or knows that there's read replicas, and then tells the database, this is exactly what I want. I want, I want these transactions to show up as committed or something, or I want to have this. Uh, I mean, so to, to, to you know, do a snapshot isolation, you usually need a, some kind of transaction ID, and B, you need to know which, what's committed and what's not committed. Um, and so the client could play a role in that, but that usually increases the, the operational complexity by quite a lot right now. You cannot just drop it into, into any, uh, any program. So ideally, you, you kind of hide that from the client. Um, it also does tend to like involve the client now suddenly has to do a lot of work to collect information from different nodes, maybe before it does a query, so actually the response times goes up, so you're kind of still making some sort of trade-offs. And um, in some cases, like whenever we looked at snapshot isolation, we always found, like if we wanted to just bake it into Citus itself, we found that um, like the number of network round trips we suddenly had to do while holding onto locks was kind of prohibitive for performance. Um, there are some ways with like super accurate clocks where everyone agrees like, oh, this is the current time to sort of get around that problem and minimize the time uh, to, to wait. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's one of those things where, like I was gonna say, uh, as I said at the beginning, it's a very unsatisfying thing to talk about because I don't have any solutions. I just have trade-offs. 